Well, it's, uh, it's great to be here with you uh, and thinking about this topic of the church. Uh, while we're talking about Bible translations, I just, I can't help but mention that um, that first uh, quest quiz question that we had before, in the original Hebrew manuscripts, uh, there are no chapters. Uh, so when I said false, uh, I think I was right. Uh, <laughs> Okay, I'm still tormented actually and, and uh, by a, uh, a youth qu- a quiz that we had when I was a pastor of uh, the church in Tasmania. And the question was, how many colours are there in the rainbow? And I said infinite, uh, okay, and I was wrong, it was seven, okay? I was wrong, <laughs> okay? I'm always penalised for being too right, I don't know. <laughs> don't know if you have that problem as well. Um, we can share that pain later if that's you. Uh, but it's great to be here, here with you thinking about the church. Let's, let's pray as we come to God's Word. Our dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you have called us out of darkness and into your marvellous light. Uh, and Lord, that you've called us not as individuals, uh, but as a church, uh, a bride beautifully dressed for her husband, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Lord, we pray that as we think about what the church is now and over this weekend, Lord, we ask that you would grow our love for you, uh, and Lord, most particularly that you would grow our love for the church, uh, and Lord, for each other, we ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Uh, I remember when I was a kid, I, uh, I used to love to look at uh, tools in my dad's garage. Uh, you know, dad was a kind of a bit of a home handyman. Uh, and he had all kinds of tools that uh, he had lying around, uh, or not lying around, but well-ordered, I think, really, is probably a fair thing to say. There were saws and hammers and drills and uh, pliers, rulers, chisels, planes, whatever else. Uh, lots of the tools I could look at, and I kind of knew what they were. I probably had seen him using them, or they kind of looked obvious. It's kind of a, a hammer. You sort of know what's going on. A spade sort of makes sense when you look at it. Uh, but other things I found mystifying. Uh, They looked kind of interesting and fun, but I didn't know what they were for. And one of those that kind of sticks in my mind is an impact driver. Now, I don't know if you know what an impact driver is, but it kind of looks like a screwdriver. It has a screwdriver end, but it's something that you hit with a hammer. Uh, And the one thing I knew as a kid was that you didn't hit screwdrivers with a hammer. Uh, That screwdrivers were for screwing things in, not for hitting with a hammer. Uh, I found that there was this kind of tool. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know how it worked. Uh, and it left me kind of confused and bewildered until that is I asked what my dad uh, my, my dad what it was for and he explained it's for driving screws in or, or, or um, unscrewing tight screws but sometimes the point is uh, that sometimes you need to know what something is and how it works before you can use it you look at it and you kind of might have an idea about what it's supposed to be for but you might be wrong or you just I uh, don't really have a clue. And that's true, of course, of things like tools and, and so on. But it's also true of, of other things. It's true of things like marriage. Uh, we recognize that marriage uh, can be a wonderful thing, but we also recognize that it can be challenging and complex. Uh, and so a lot of churches, because of that, when a couple is uh, looking to get married, they would spend a bit of time preparing them for marriage, explaining what marriage is and how it works, some of the challenges, some of the pitfalls, some of the opportunities, some of the joys. And then even after a couple is married, you would spend a little bit of time with them maybe in the years to come, helping them to think through how things are going. Maybe you, maybe you as a church, I don't know, have marriage enrichment seminars or, or opportunities for discipleship in marriage. Those things people recognize often are helpful because marriage, even though it's so common, you know, lots of people are married, it's also very complex and very difficult to understand. Uh, Workplaces too are like that. Workplaces often have orientation uh, courses or or, uh, processes because they recognize that as someone comes into this, this workplace, there are lots of things that they don't know or don't understand. Uh, and they need to know them in order to be to sort of function well in that workplace. Alternatively, they might come in with a whole lot of assumptions about how things work, and actually they're wrong, and those sort of things need to be sort of clarified before they get into work so that they can thrive and, and the workplace uh, can be a happy one. There are lots of things in life that we do and we use and we experience but we need to kind of know how they work in order for us to function well in them. 
And that's true as well of the church. Church is a complex thing. It's a wonderful place. We're brought into it, uh, you know, by the gospel. Uh, but it can also be a challenging place. It can be a confusing place. And there are lots of things which happen that maybe we take for granted and we don't really understand why we do them. Uh, maybe we too come into the church with all kinds of assumptions that we've just assumed that things go like this or should be like this, but actually we're mistaken about that. Why, why is that? Maybe that's not right. And maybe, as you sit here this morning, maybe that's how you feel. Maybe you, as you look around at church sometimes, you think to yourself, what are we actually doing? Why are we doing that and not this? Or maybe you think, we, we should be doing this and we're not doing it. But actually maybe you're mistaken about that. Maybe you've misunderstood something. Maybe everyone else has misunderstood something. Uh, and so what I want to do over the next few talks that uh, we're thinking about these things together, I want to think with you about what the church is uh, and what it does and then also why it does that. Uh, so in the next talk uh, later today, we're going to be thinking about uh, what we do as a church and, uh, and kind of what the basics of church life is about. Uh, tomorrow we'll think about the church and the role of the individual it's, and sort of consumerism and also about the church and its weakness and, and disappointments. But in this talk, in this first talk, I want to sort of, I guess, begin at the beginning and think about what the church is and how that isness uh, shapes what we do and how we think about the church. So the first thing I think to say is that at the heart of the idea of the church, at the heart of what the church is, is gathering. Uh, so the word that the early Christians used to describe the church or to name the church uh, drew on ideas both from the Old Testament but also from the kind of world in which they lived, uh, the, from the Greek wor uh, world. They used this term ecclesia, uh, you might have heard that before, uh, and its background lies in Greek democracy. Okay, so uh, it, the ecclesia that, uh, was a kind of this assembly of citizens that you would have in a city, and this assembly would kind of meet 30 or 40 times a year maybe to make decisions about the city. It was kind of like a city council or something like that, but it was made up of, uh, of uh, citizens from within the city. Uh, and belonging to this ecclesia was a bit like maybe a politician might belong to the House of Representatives. So, uh, that is, you belong to the House of Representatives when you're, you know, going about your work in your member's office. You know, so Anthony Albanese has his member's office in Marrickville. Okay, he's, he's a member of the House of Representatives when he's there. Uh, but actually, the, the business, if you like, of the House of Representatives is to meet together and to make decisions together. Uh, and this is kind of the background, uh, and that's the kind of at the heart of this word ecclesia. It's this idea of uh, gathering together uh, to do this this business. Uh, and this is the word that uh, the the New Testament writers uh, use to describe the church. Now that same word uh, was also used already in the Old Testament in the Greek translation of the Old Testament uh, that was around in Jesus' day, and in that translation, this term ecclesia uh, had been used to refer to one of the great meetings or great gatherings of the Old Testament. Now that great gathering was the gathering of God's people after he brought them out of Egypt. He gathered them at Mount Sinai uh, and God appeared to them and, and he spoke to them the Ten Commandments uh, and uh, he gave them the tabernacle and the religious uh, kind of the Old Testament sacrificial system and so on. But that gathering there was called a church, and it's that particular church uh, meeting between God and His people at Sinai that's being talked about in those verses that Amy read for us just before. Uh, the writer of Hebrews says, we've not come to a mountain like that, we've not come to that kind of church, he says, uh, we've come to something different, to a different kind of church. He begins in verse 18 to 21, talking about what this church service was like. And actually, it's a little bit imposing, okay? It's terrifying. There's lightning, gloom, and storm. Uh, it's not just kind of lighting effects. It's not smoke machines. Uh, it is genuine lightning, genuine gloom, genuine storm. 
Uh, the voice of God speaks to the people, and it's so terrifying that people beg that God speak to them no more, that they speak instead through Mo- that God speaks to them through Moses. Uh, it's a terrifying encounter. Uh, enc- encounter. It's a, it's a wonderful encounter in many ways. The God of heaven and earth coming to engage with his people, but it's also terrifying. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, well, we haven't come to that church meeting, to that kind of church meeting, but we have come to another church meeting, a meeting in the heavenly places. He calls it uh, a a, a church meeting. It's a meeting with angels, uh, with those who belong to God, whose names are written in heaven. It's a meeting of what the writer calls uh, the spirits of the righteous made perfect. Uh, The picture that the, the writer of Hebrews gives us Uh, is a picture of a church gathering, which is first and foremost a heavenly gathering. He's not talking about all the people in Jerusalem getting together at the temple. Uh, He's saying that actually by the Spirit, all these people who are believers, in fact, in the context of Hebrews, all these people even from the Old Testament era as well, all those are gathered in this heavenly gathering around the throne of of God. It's a gathering by God's Spirit around Jesus, uh, the Messiah and Saviour. And so at the heart of uh, this, the meaning of this word church, the idea of the church, is the idea of gathering, but the most crucial sense in which we're gathered is not simply in local churches uh, or on, in conferences, but around the throne of Christ in heaven. That is the most central idea. Uh, we're gathered into a church, into this, the church of all believers, gathered by the Spirit around the throne of Christ in heaven. So you could turn up to church, to this church or another church, uh, every day of your life for 50 years. Uh, you could serve on the roster, you could preach sermons, you could win people to Christ, you could help run evangelistic courses. Uh, but none of those things actually make you a member of the church, the church in heaven gathered around Christ. Just like you could turn up to Parliament every day for 50 years, uh, you could sit in the gallery, that wouldn't make you a member of the House of Representatives. Okay, this is probably not going to come as a surprise to many of you here, but it, it needs to be said, that is, belonging to a local church, doing church things, doesn't actually make you a Christian, it doesn't make you a member of that heavenly gathering. Serving in a church doesn't make you a Christian. It doesn't save you from de- sin and death and judgment. Jesus says in, in uh, the Sermon on the Mount that many will come to him on that last day and say, didn't we uh, prophesy in your name and in your name drive out many demons? So we're doing amazing kind of Christian works. And Jesus says, and I'll say to them, I never knew you. It's a terrifying reality. It's a terrifying thought. We don't become Christians by being in and around church or doing churchy things or Christian things. Rather, we become Christians when we receive and trust Jesus and he gathers us to himself through the Spirit. To be a member of the church, you need to repent, to turn away from your sin and to put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And whatever else we do with church, we must never lose that central focus. We must never stop saying that. That what makes us a member of the church is repentance from sin and faith in Jesus Christ. That's the first thing, the first implication uh, of what the church is. But having said that, having said that that's the most important thing, That does not mean that's the only thing. Church is not only about the spiritual gathering in the heavenly places. It's not that the local church is unimportant because of that. The New Testament also wants us to know that this hidden spiritual reality of believers gathered by the Spirit around the throne of Christ in heaven, that spiritual reality comes into view and is reflected in the gathering of Christians in local churches, in visible communities. We see again and again in the New Testament that believers 
uh, met together. They didn't meet as the worldwide church already within, you know, really a couple of uh, years. There, there's so many believers in different places that it, it's not possible for them to meet together. There's believers in Galatia and in Ephesus, uh, in Jerusalem, uh, and so on, in Rome. It wasn't practical for them all to meet together, but they did meet as little groups of believers. Uh, earlier in the book of Hebrews, the writer writes to uh, the people and he says that they shouldn't give up meeting together. In other words, they can't just say to themselves, read chapter 12 and say to themselves, well, look at this, I'm gathered by the Spirit around Christ in the heavenly places. I don't need to meet with other believers. He says, don't give up meeting together. You need to keep doing that, he says, so that you don't abandon the faith and become hardened in unbelief. You need to keep doing that. It's part of what it means to be the church. Uh, in the role that I have uh, already as a pastor, but, but particularly now, I think, as a lecturer at a Bible college, people often ask me tricky questions that they have. Uh, and once a person came to me uh, because a couple uh, who were about to be married that they knew, uh, a couple were, was asking them if it was okay for them to get married but then not live together. Now, I thought that was a, a kind of a strange question because it seemed to reflect a complete misunderstanding of what marriage was about, right? It, it, marriage changes your life. It changes how you live. It changes what you do. It changes where you live and who you live with. And it's the same, really, with belonging to the church. We can have radically kind of out-of-whack ideas about what the church is about. It doesn't make any sense, though, the New Testament says, for us to belong to this spiritual gathering and then not be in a local gathering of believers. It doesn't make any sense to be connected to God's people spiritually, but then to be disconnected from God's people physically. Uh, your weekly gatherings uh, as a church, your daily gatherings uh, in other settings as you meet together as God's people are reflections of something mysterious and wonderful. Of the fact that you're gathered as God's people around Christ by the Spirit. Uh, and as you meet together week in and week out, you're bringing that hidden reality into visible expression. And so you need to keep doing that, to keep meeting together, as the writer of Hebrews says, to not give up meeting together, to keep showing who you are in Christ, to keep pointing ahead to what we will be. Your church gatherings might often seem quite insignificant. Sometimes they might seem a bit tiring. Sometimes they might get in the way of other things that you would like to be doing. Sometimes they might seem quite plain or weak or unspectacular. But you need to keep reminding yourself every time you come together as God's people, there is a ref you are reflecting something profound and wonderful. Union with Christ, with God's people in the heavenly places. So the church is a community uh, gathered around Christ. It's a spiritual thing. It's also uh, reflected physically in local churches. That's the first uh, two ideas, if you like. But the New Testament also shows us that the church is a new humanity. So it's not just a gathering, okay? It's also, here's another metaphor, if you like. It's a new humanity. Uh, to think about that, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. It's there in the, uh, in the handout as well, the, the booklet. So you can look there. Uh, and Ephesians chapter 2. And from verse 11, so Paul's just been talking about the wonder of salvation. They were dead in trespasses and sins, and now he's kind of moving on 
uh, and he says there in verse 11, Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of promise, without hope and without God in the world. Okay, so Paul is writing here to the Ephesians. They're Gentile Christians, okay, so they're non-Jewish. They come from a non-Jewish background, okay? And he's saying that in the Old Testament era, these non-Jewish people, these Gentiles, by and large, not exclusively, but by and large, were separated from God. They were far away from God. So all the privileges of God that came to his people through the law and through the prophets, through his blessings uh, to the people and so on, that the Gentiles were, were kind of far away from that. God was doing that thing with his people here and the, and the Gentiles were far away. But, but Paul says, that's what you were. Don't forget that's what you were. But now, verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Okay, so God's work in Christ has brought them near to God uh, and God's forgiveness through Jesus has made that possible. Okay, So that's great for the Gentiles. But, but Paul then goes on to say, okay, but actually the Jews also were far away from God as well and needed to be reconciled to him. So uh, he says in verse 16 that God's plan was to reconcile, to in one body rather, to reconcile both of them, so both of them is Jew and Gentile, to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. So Paul's saying here that in the death of Jesus, uh, God has not only put to death the hostility between Gentile people and God, but also between the Jewish people who kind of looked nearer, uh, but that host there was hostility there as well that needed to be put to death uh, between both kinds of people, between the Jewish people and the non-Jewish people. Verse 17, he came, uh, Jesus, and preached peace to you who are far away and peace to those who are near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by the one Spirit. Uh, so those are really all, all the same ideas that we had in Hebrews. God's gathered a people to himself through the gospel and a people who have peace uh, with him. Okay, but peace with God is not the only consequence of the gospel. He says in verse 14 and 15, which we skipped over, for he himself, Jesus, is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose, here it is, was to create in himself, that is in, in Jesus, one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. Okay, so here's the big, the big play. Not only has God brought us near to him, but Paul says that God has also created one new humanity out of the two. Uh, there's something really kind of deeply profound going on here that's worth taking some time to get our heads around. Uh, you see, it's, it's important to know that when we are born into the world, all of us, when we're born into the world, are born into the world as children of Adam. Uh, but as children of Adam... Okay, we're also condemned and corrupted. Paul talks about that in Ephesians chapter 2 in the first part where he says that we are by nature objects of wrath. We're that by nature. So from our very constitution is as objects of wrath because our very constitution is sinful people. David can say uh, in one of the Psalms, I was sinful from the, from the time my mother conceived me. We're born into this world with sinful and corrupt desires. We hate God by nature. We don't need to be taught that. We, we just do it instinctively. Uh, we're greedy by nature. We don't have to practice being greedy. We just are. Uh, we want what others have by nature. Okay? We, we covet by nature. We're sexually immoral by nature. We don't have to try to do those things. We don't need people to teach us to do those things. We don't have to learn them. They're woven into us. 
But Jesus, in taking on humanity, has not only accepted the condemnation that we deserve because of that, he's also forged in himself, in his own person, a new humanity that is perfect and blameless and indestructible. And when we come to Jesus, God not only forgives us, right, brings the peace, reconciles us to God, God not only does that, but we also become participants with Jesus in this new humanity. We begin to share in this new life of Jesus. Now, that doesn't mean that we suddenly become perfect and everything is hunky-dory, right? We won't be perfect and blameless until the day when Jesus raises us from the dead and presents us to his Father without spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Ephesians chapter 5. But we do already now become spiritually alive to God. Okay, we do already now begin to share in the life of Jesus. The Holy Spirit unites us to Christ and His powerful death increasingly kills off our sin and His powerful life as the new Adam, the new humanity, comes to realization in our life by the power of the Spirit. Okay, the Bible describes that spiritual reality as being born again. Okay, we're born again into a new humanity, into the, into the family of God. And that is not just a kind of a, that's not just a status. God calls us new, but there is it's something existential, okay? That is something at the level of our existence. We're not just called God's children, but there's a profound way in which by the Spirit we're united to Christ and we are God's children. We now share something, if you like, of God's DNA. Jesus is the perfect image of God, the writer of Hebrews says in chapter 1, and through the Spirit he shares something of that image with us uh, that he's joined with his humanity. Uh, when a human family adopts a child, the child's brought into the family, okay? But it always remains, the child always remains, in some sense, different. Okay, it's a wonderful, it's a precious thing to, ad to adopt someone into, into your family. But there is always this underlying difference. Genetically, not the same. But when God brings us into his family, when he adopts us into his family, we not only gain the status, we belong, which is precious, but we also gain the character of the family as well, the DNA of the family. In other words, belonging to this heavenly church changes us. It changes us at the level of our existence. It's impossible to join the church and to be the same as you always have been. So if you're the same today as you were five years ago or ten years ago or fifty years ago, there's good reasons to wonder if you really are part of that heavenly church. Because people who belong to that church are different. They're changed by the Spirit to be like Jesus. They bear the fruit of the Spirit. They're more loving. They're, they're more joyful, more, more peaceable, uh, more patient, kinder, gentler, more faithful, more self-controlled. They love God more. They love their brothers and sisters in Christ more. And maybe as you look at your life, as you've been a Christian, as you've been a part of the church, Maybe you can see that. Maybe you look at your life and you see that God has changed you. It might be like John Newton said, um, I'm not what I should be, I'm not what I will be, but I'm not what I was. It's not that you become perfect, but there's a difference, there's a discernible difference. And if you see that, what a great encouragement to know that you belong to that 
invisible spiritual church. Not just Gray City, that's great. But that church gathered around Christ in the heavenly places. There's, there's an evidence of that. But on, on the flip side, you might actually look at yourself and you might think, and, and this is a great thing to go away and do, to think more deeply about this and to pray, Lord, show me the evidences of this fruit, fruit in my life. You might look and you might, you might find there doesn't seem to be anything much. You, you struggle to put your finger on a way that you've changed. If that's you, the, the temptation can be to sort of put your head in the sand and say, oh no, it's, it's okay. Uh, it can be quite confronting, I think, to suddenly discover that although you've been sort of saying you're a Christian for 10 years and being part of a church, it can be quite confronting to discover that maybe actually you have never really embraced the gospel. You're not really a Christian. Or maybe you're not really sure. Either way, if that's you, let me encourage you not to be embarrassed by that. But to take that opportunity that God has given you to say, Lord, it, it looks to me as though maybe I haven't really understood the gospel, that I haven't really come to know Christ, that my life is the same as it's always been. That I haven't really left sin behind. I haven't really trusted Jesus. Lord, I'm not sure if I've ever really become a Christian because there's no signs in my life. Lord, if that's really true, then please forgive me in Jesus and please make me a new person. Join me with him by your Holy Spirit. Work out his life, his death in me. Don't be afraid to say that. And you can say to God too, Lord, I don't know where I am. Please show me. And if you are at work in my life, please help me to know it. Show me the things that you're doing, that you're working in, in me. We need to be wary, uh, not only, uh, we need to be wary of no change in our own life. Do we really belong? Do I see the evidence, the fruit of that? Uh, we also should be wary, I think, of no real change in those around us. If we're part of a church, we're looking out for each other. And if there are people around us that we love and care for who really, it's hard to see any discernible difference in their life, then with great humility and, and patience and kindness, we probably need to speak to them about that and to ask them whether they've truly come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not seeking perfection, but we are seeking people who have changed and who bear increasingly the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so the church is a gathering around Christ in the heavenly places that's reflected in our local communities. It's a new humanity born again through the Spirit of Christ. It's also a family. Okay, so a key co consequence of being born again is not just being changed at this individual level, but being brought into this family of believers. Uh, we've seen in the beginning of Ephesians 2, Paul talks about that, Jews and Gentiles, they were separated from God, uh, they've been brought near to Him, but they've also been brought near to he each other. Okay, so God is making one new humanity out of two. Okay, before they were separated from each other, but now they are united, not only with God, but also with each other. Uh, that's why Paul can say things in a number of his other letters, like in Galatians, Galatians 3.28, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. He's brought us near not only to God, but to each other. At the same time as destroying the dividing wall between us and God, he's also broken down the dividing wall that separates us as human beings. Okay, and the, the, the second is grounded in the first. It's because we're brought near to God together that all the other dividing walls are, are broken down. The unity that we have uh, as a new humanity, as a new family, transcends every other kind of unique characteristic that we have. So Don, Don Carson writes, uh, I think this is in your notes, he says, Ideally, however, the church itself is not made up of natural friends, it is made up of natural enemies. 
What binds us together is not common education, common race, common income levels, common politics, common nationality, common accents, common jobs or anything else of that sort. Christians come together not because they form a natural collection, but because they all have been saved by Jesus Christ and owe him a common allegiance. They are a band of natural enemies who love one another for Jesus' sake. Now, I think at an intellectual level, maybe we probably believe that. If pressed on the theology, we probably say that's true. But often, functionally, we don't really think or, or live like that. Uh, one of the most common areas, I think, uh, that we kind of push against this is with age. We, we're always looking for kind of other things to unite us. And, and age is one of those things where we do that um, quite often. Uh, so people often leave one church to find another because they, can't, they, they say, I, I can't find anyone in my own church who is my age. Uh, now, at one level, that's understandable, okay? I'm not saying that that's a, a, an egregious sin from which uh, you cannot recover. But I do just want to push back and say, w what we do when we do those kinds of things and think in those ways is we perpetuate a vision of the church where what fundamentally unites us is not the gospel, but secondary characteristics. I worked uh, for a year when I left Bible college. Uh, I worked for a year in a small town in northwest Tasmania. Uh, it was a population maybe of 10 or 15,000 people. It was a small church. Uh, and there was no one there. I don't think, I'm not sure if there was anyone there my age, to be honest. There's certainly no one there with my interest. There was no sackbutt players. Um, <laughs> actually, I wasn't playing sackbutt then, but. Uh, you know, I have an odd assortment of interests. I'm willing to own that, okay? That no one there with my interests, no one there my age. Uh, but because my job was to do ministry, I ended up joining a Bible study full of ladies who I think all were widows and I think all were over the age of 70. Maybe, maybe that might explain a bit about me, uh, my personality now, but... Right, but if I wasn't being paid to do ministry, I would not have I, I would not have joined that Bible study. Uh, but it was wonderful; it was lovely. On Thursday night, we'd gathered together uh, in a shabby, you know, kind of room in the church hall, uh, and we'd study the Bible together and we'd share our lives together, uh, and it was wonderful. It was lovely. Uh, I went out for lunch. Sometimes they'd invite me out for lunch. My sister came to visit, and two of the old ladies. Uh, both in their 70s, invited my sister and I to go for lunch with them in the RSL. <laughs> uh, one of them invited me over for dinner every Thursday night. I go for dinner, uh, and she and I, just the two of us, she, I think she was in her 80s, we'd sit down and we'd have dinner together uh, every Thursday night. It was a bit awkward. <laughs> but it was actually really lovely. Uh, and when I had to leave the church at the end of the year, uh, we all, they, they threw a party, okay? We, we went to the RSL together. Um, <laughs> it's a small town, okay? <laughs> uh, and one of them had, had, had knitted me a cardigan. I love cardigans. Um, and one of them had knitted me a cardigan. But in, 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 so in, in every way, they were unlike me okay but they were family uh, and i think one of the tragedies is that we so often close ourselves off to those possibilities because we look for the escape route of common age and common interests uh, and we don't push into that 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 challenge of being united by something deeper by the gospel uh, we, we, we're always asking those other questions are they my age are they married? Are they not married? Uh, are they, do they have kids? Do they have kids my age? Uh, do they have kids who have the same experiences as my kids? Do they like the same things that I like? Do they share my political convictions? But that's not what the church is about. The church is a family of 
wildly different people who've been called together by the gospel and united into a family by Jesus Christ. Okay, so the church is a gathering. Okay, it's a new humanity. It's a family. And finally, the church is a building being built together. So look at verse 19 of chapter 2 in Ephesians. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. When I was growing up in the church, I was blessed to grow up in a Christian family and to be in the church from a young age. The one thing I knew is that the church wasn't the building. Okay, but it's interesting that in the Bible, the church isn't a building, but it's often a lot like a building. It's actually one of the key images that's used to describe the the church. Uh, And that's what Paul is saying here. How is the church like a building? He, He lists a number of things. Well, first, it's like a building in that Jesus is the chief cornerstone. Okay, so the cornerstone was the the big stone from which the whole building got its alignment. Okay, Uh, so that so the church is 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 like a building that Jesus gives the alignment to the whole church. Second, the church is like a building in that it has a foundation. Okay, the foundation is the teaching of the apostles and prophets written down for us in the scriptures. Jesus is the cornerstone. The foundation is the words of God uh, in the scriptures. Third, the church is like a building, or more specifically, it's like a temple. Uh, A temple is a unique building where God lives. Okay, So the church is like a building in that God dwells there by His Spirit in His people. And finally, the church is also like a building in that the people are being built together. Okay, To make up the building. The the, the building is made up of stones uh, and materials that are being built together and formed into a building. Uh, And I think, in particular, it's that last idea which is the one that we maybe struggle with the most. Okay, what does it mean to be built uh, together? At one level, I think it means that being built together with others is a fundamental part of uh, of belonging uh, to Jesus. So, you can't be a brick on your own. Okay, a brick on its own is not a building. If you have a brick in your backyard and I came to visit... And you said, look at my lovely building. I would say, that's not a building. <laughs> that is just a brick. Okay? Uh, a brick on its own is, isn't a building. So to, to be part of the church, to belong to the church, you need to be being built together with other people. Uh, later, Paul says, we'll come to this tomorrow, that, that we build each other up. All right? The way that, we, that the church is built is by each of us doing ministry to each other. Uh, but, but we need to be being built together in order to really belong. That's part of what it means to be the church. Uh, but it also, I think, this idea of, of, of being built together into this building also has a, a, a more challenging implication, I think. And that is, it suggests that at the heart of the kind of the Christian self-conception is not me as an individual, but us as a building. Okay? At the heart of how we think of ourselves is not me as an individual, but us as a building. The end goal of God's plan is not lots of individual beautiful bricks. Okay? It's not to look out in the backyard and to see there's a beautiful brick, and there's a beautiful brick, and there's a beautiful brick, right? That's not, that's not the plan. The plan is to see a beautiful building. So think about the, uh, the sails of the Sydney Opera House. The sails of the Opera House are made up of uh, millions of tiles. Uh, if you go and stand, as I did a few years ago after having lived in other states for about 20 years, if you go up and stand next to the sails of the Opera House, my experience is underwhelmment, if that's a word. It looks a bit like up close, like a 1970s bathroom or something like that. Okay, like the tiles actually are quite ordinary, like, and they're a bit, 
shabby, I think, like uh, a bit dated, okay? Like the Opera House is not amazing because the individual tiles are amazing. It's amazing because it's, they've been put together into an amazing building, okay? It's, and it's a breathtaking building, isn't it? If you stand back and can see the whole, you don't look at it and think, what a great bunch of tiles. <laughs> you look back and you say, what an amazing building. Uh, and if you were to go there at night, I don't recommend this, but if you were to go there at night and you were to take a crowbar and you were to steal one of the tiles <laughs> and you were to take it home and you were to hang it uh, on your wall in the lounge room, I suspect most people who came in would think, what is that weird tile doing hanging on the wall? That is, once you take the tile out of the building, it loses its glory. And even if it has glory up on your wall, why is that? It's because you say, that tile once belonged to the Opera House. And I think the biblical image of the church is like that. Why are you beautiful as a Christian? It's because you belong to the church and you're being built together. I think our mental image as we come into church is this. I'm a wonderfully gifted and beautiful person and I will bring value to this church, which is true. Okay, that's not untrue. But I think the more profound biblical view is I'm beautiful because I belong to this building. And actually, you take that beauty that you have as you're being formed together at Grace City. You take that beauty that you have as all the hard edges are being chopped off so that you can fit more perfectly with one another. You take that beauty out into the world where you are. Not the other way around. Not you bringing your beauty into the church, but actually you taking that beauty of a building gathered together, built together uh, into the world. Okay, That's not to eliminate any distinctions between us. It's not to say that we don't have gifts. Clearly not. But rather it is, as Paul argues in 1 Corinthians 12, uh, it's to frame, when he talks about another biblical image, okay, uh, it's to frame things in terms of uh, the context, okay? So the other biblical image is the, is the church as a body, okay? The body doesn't get its significance from the parts. The parts get their identity and significance from the body, okay? And what Paul does in 1 Corinthians 12 is to frame those distinctions, ear, nose, leg, toe, to frame those distinctions within the context of a more fundamental identity, which is the body. Yes, our identity is found in Christ, but Christ is the cornerstone of a building and the head of a body. And those fundamental identities, those fundamental relationships shape us. We're being built together. We're being changed into a building, uh, into a body. Uh, there's something profoundly shaping and significant about your church. Uh, it defines you. You might not think, think of it in this way, but this church defines you. It shapes you. It builds you. It builds your life together with the life of others and you carry that with you into all the different places where God has put you. There's a million things I think we can say about the church from the scriptures, but I think those ideas are some of the most important. That the church is a gathering, gathered by the Spirit around Christ in the heavenly places, which is reflected in our local gatherings. It's a, a new humanity being transformed into the image of Christ. It's a family united by the gospel and it's a building being built together. Let me pray.
Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the deep truths of the gospel, uh, which are truths which not only shape us as individuals, but Lord, shape us as a community of people. And Lord, I want to thank you in particular for this church, this local gathering of believers, Lord, who even as we're gathered here now, are reflecting a profound spiritual reality. Lord, that even as we sit here in this room, we're also seated in heaven around the throne of Christ. Lord, we pray that you would help to reshape our vision of you and your church and of who we are in that. And I pray, Lord, that you would do that for this church, for Jesus' sake.